contain our praise no longer, right? Rejoice greatly. Shout for joy. Blessed is the King. It said, Jesus, we worship your holy name. Praise God. Who wants to shout for joy? Who wants to praise Jesus? All right. That is exactly what we are here to do today. Today we know it. Today is called Palm Sunday, which is always the last Sunday before Easter, never changes. It commemorates the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem just a week before his crucifixion. When at that time the crowds, they shouted, they praised him, they threw palm branches down before him. But we're going to see the jubilation on that day was only a thin veneer, which was covering the fact that Palm Sunday was the day of a tragically missed opportunity. A day that moved Jesus to sob from a broken heart and a day that sealed the fate of a nation. And we're going to see why. Why did that happen? So please turn with me to Luke 19. 28 through 44. We're going to read it this morning. After he had said these things, <clears throat> he was going on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. When he approached, approached Bethpage and Bethany near the mouth that is called Olivet, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you. There as you enter, you will find a colt tied on which no one yet has ever sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord has need of it. They brought it to Jesus, and they threw their coats on the colt and put Jesus on it. And he was going. As he was going, they were spreading their coats on the road. As soon as he was approaching near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the miracles which they had seen, shouting, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the heights. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But Jesus answered, I tell you, if these become silent, the stones will cry out. When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children within you and they will not leave you in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation lord i just pray this morning through your word that we will praise you and give you glory as we see what you have done for us Lord, let us see through your scripture the very danger of not recognizing the time of your visitation. Lord, we praise you and thank you for what you've done for us. Please give these words this morning a place to rest in our hearts. May it compel us and change us. In your name we pray. Amen. So we're going to see a few things this morning. First, we're going to look at the superficial celebration of the Jews here. Look in verses 28 and 29. Jesus, it says, was going to Jerusalem. And when he approached Bethpage and Bethany, we know from uh, the Gospel of John in John 12, 1, that Jesus was going to Jerusalem at what time? It's at Passover time. Passover was one of the three annual festivals that every adult Jew they were required to attend. They had to go. The other two were Pentecost and the Feast of Ingathering or the Feast of Tabernacles. But consequently here, 
Jerusalem's population of 20 to 30,000 people is swelled to hundreds of thousands of people at this time. So there was a lot of people. The inns were full, so people slept in the streets and tented in the countryside all the way out to Bethany, which was two miles away. Here is the Temple Mount. All right? Here you have the Kidron Valley. Here you have the Garden of Gethsemane. And right here, you have the Mount of Olives, this whole area right here. And this is where Jesus comes in, right in here. When he starts going down, and he, he's at Bethany, starting here about two miles away. Okay? The buzz was around town. Jesus is here. Pilgrims from far away were being told of the miracle worker, and especially his latest uh, miracle, which was what? It was the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So when Jesus arrived here at Bethany, it was a place where only a few months earlier, he had risen, uh, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. Pretty big. The crowd swarmed at this time out to see him. John 12, 9 tells us that they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. To understand the significance of this, to understand the significance of Jesus coming to Bethany at this time, let's just step back a little, okay? So at this time, a few months earlier, at the time when Jesus raised Lazarus, the religious establishment had a problem. They were so infuriated by the miracle and the fact that many were believing in Jesus because of it, and they were angry. They were angry. They held a meeting, and in that meeting in John 11, 45 through 53, they voted to now kill Jesus. We're going to kill him. We're so angry with what he's done. This has gone on too far. It's time to kill this guy. It's time to kill him. So knowing this, Jesus knew. He went into temporary seclusion with his disciples to the isolated village of Ephraim, about 15 miles north of Bethany. Well, the Pharisees, they were unable to find him. So they put a hit out on Jesus and ordered anyone who knew where he was to report it so that they could come, the Bible says, and seize him and kill him. In John 11, 53 through 54 and verse 57. They're out to get him. They want to kill him. So at this time, the crowds were seeking Jesus but could not find him. And they were starting to wonder something. They were wondering if he himself would risk this death, would he attend Passover? I wonder if Jesus will come to Passover. But of course, the Pharisees nor the crowds understood that Jesus came into this world for that very purpose, to die. That was his purpose. See, we die because we are born. Jesus was born to die. Little did they know. Little did they know. What a magnificent statement of truth that Jesus was born into this world for this very purpose at this very time, to die for us. So continuing through the timeline, go over to Luke 18, 31 through 33, if you'd like. Then he took the twelve aside and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and all these things which are written through the prophets about the Son of Man will be accomplished. For he will be handed over to the Gentiles, and will be mocked, and mistreated, and spit upon. And after they have scourged him, they will kill him. And the third day, he will rise again. Wow. So our Lord's temporary withdrawal to Ephraim before showing himself at Bethany was only to prepare his heart for the ordeal. The ordeal that he was about to face for us. The ordeal he was about to face for you. See, he had us in mind from eternity past. And he had us in mind on that day. And to this very day, he has mankind in mind. Interestingly, though, now that Jesus was back, the Pharisees and the Sadducees seeking the crowds, uh, seeing the crowds were so excited 
over this risen Lazarus, they decided to not only put Jesus on the kill list, they decided to add Lazarus to the list. We're going to kill him too. So they just put out Lazarus on the list in John 22, I mean John 12, 10. You can imagine their embarrassment. Can you imagine what an embarrassment the risen Lazarus was to the Sadducees who themselves taught there was no resurrection of the dead? And right here stands somebody contradicting everything they were teaching. He was risen from the dead, so we're going to kill him too. Not to mention that when Jesus himself would rise from the dead, which we're going to look at next week. Amen? Praise the Lord. We do serve a risen Savior. So in his, uh, you know, truly, pride stands in the way of reason, of proof, and truth. It was right there for them to see. But in preparation for his entry into Jerusalem, Jesus did something that was very, very unusual, very unusual, especially for him. Jesus normally walked everywhere they went. When you go into Israel, it's not a big country, but it's a big country if you have to walk across it. <laughs> I mean, they walked everywhere they went. Charles Spurgeon, I went off the to topic here, he just said in a message I listened to, people in his day would walk 10 miles to just come hear the word of God. I'll just leave it there. He normally walked everywhere he went. But on this day, what did Jesus do? He sent his disciples to obtain a colt, a very young donkey, to ride for his entry into Jerusalem in Luke 19, verses 30 through 34. And the news now, the news of his coming, spread like wildfire. The miracle worker is coming, verse 37. Here comes Jesus. He's coming. He's actually going to come to Passover. The crowds following him from Bethany were met by the multitudes coming out of Jerusalem. And the two streams came together and began to throw their coats on the ground before him, as well as throwing the palm branches and raising the palm branches. John 12, 12 through 13. What are palm branches? They're a symbol. They're a symbol and emblems of victory and triumph. We're victorious. The king is here. We're triumphant. He's here. But we know this celebration will end in a crucifixion. There's coming a day of celebration, though, praise God. Did you know that there's coming a day of celebration when we shall, with the multitudes, wave our palm branches to the triumphant Lord God. Did you know this will happen again? But it will happen in glory. Revelation 7, 9 through 10 says, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could count from every nation and all the tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches, were in their hands. And they cry out with a loud voice saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. There's coming a day when we all will have palm branches in our hand. And this time we will be praising Him there in heaven together with all the saints. Praise God. Praise the Lamb. Amen. That will truly be uh, uh, one day that we will see and praise God that Jesus emptied himself, that he gave himself up for the church, that he paid the price for our sin. Wow. But now let's just go back to Jerusalem. They began to praise God joyfully, the word tells us, for all the miracles they had seen, for all the miracles they have heard about, as they quoted Psalm 118.26. But notice something with a one-word substitution, which revealed what was in their hearts, which revealed the true reason for their celebration. Psalm 118.26 reads, Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. They chanted, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Don't overlook that subtle 
yet monumental word change. You with me? In all four of the Gospels, the emphasis of their celebration was, was that the king was coming. They also cried, Hosanna, as we see in the other Gospels, meaning save now. So when you see this in a moment, how they inserted this word king and save now, you're going to see what they really were longing for. Luke 19.11 tells us this. This will give you a glimpse into their heart. They supposed that the kingdom of God was going to appear immediately. Here at the Passover, they thought Jesus was about to reveal himself in all his power and glory as the Messiah King. Freeing them from Roman bondage. Freeing them from the persecution they were under and bringing peace to them at last. They wanted him there now. So with all the shouting going on of the crowds, the Pharisees, they were beyond themselves. Remember, they wanted to kill him. They were already angry at him for raising Lazarus from the dead. And now they're absolutely honked off. They're really mad. They're beyond themselves. The Pharisees couldn't stand him and frustrated at their inability to seize him, lest the crowds would turn on them. They called on Jesus to rebuke the crowds. Shut these crowds down. In 1939, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Keep them quiet. The problem is they did not believe Jesus was their prophesied Messiah and Savior. And they were furious at the messianic reception that was given to Jesus. Notice what Jesus did not say. Oh, you're right. I don't deserve this praise. They're mistaken thinking I am the Messiah. Oh, okay. Hey, crowd. Our religious leaders are right. Please stop this nonsense. Please. Quiet down. The Son of God didn't say that, did he? He rejected their demand, and he stated on this occasion, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. No one staying quiet on this day. If they had remained silent, the very stones on the ground would have started singing praises to God. Can you imagine that? Do you think Jesus was just making that up? Could Jesus make stones talk? He could too. He's God. And he was going to get his praise and his glory that day. Why? Why was this day and this event so significant? That the stones would have cried out if the people would have stayed silent. Because 500 years earlier, the prophet Zechariah prophesied this very day and this very event. In Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. 500 years earlier, Matthew 21, 4 through 5 says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken about through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey, even a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Wow. Previously, what has Jesus done up to this point? Previously, he has forbidden his disciples to proclaim him as Messiah. Up to this point, he has forbidden that. Matthew 16, 20. And he previously refused the people's demand to make him king in John 6, 15. But on this day, specifically at this time, on this day, Jesus for the first and only time officially presented himself publicly as the Messiah long prophesied in their own scriptures. And today he is announcing that. 
Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. He always does. In the timing of heaven, he was fulfilling scripture to the letter and producing the donkey to ride into Jerusalem. To the cross also prophesied in scripture that he might be the savior of the world as so prophesied and his purpose in coming. And nothing was going to stop him from completing that task. So Jesus knew that this celebration of the Jews was superficial. And for all the wrong reasons. And he also knew that this would be a very short-lived experience. Jesus knew that as the week progressed along, and as he would begin to look more and more like a victim, he will be arrested, he will be flogged, he will be beaten, and he will look more and more not like a Messiah King that they wanted. That the superficial cries of the Jews now for his coronation would soon change. They would turn to the murderous cries, crucify him. Oh, how quickly they turned away. Crucify him. Oh, if they had only knew. Crucify him. Praise God. Praise God that even this happened. Jesus finished what he came to do to pay for their very sins as they cried, crucify him. Hosanna, Hosanna. Crucify him. Praise God. Praise God. Crucify him. He knew. You know, what they didn't know was his triumphal entry into Jerusalem would become mankind's triumph over spiritual death. They were not interested in a Messiah who would bring peace of heart. They wanted military peace. They were not interested in a Messiah who would bring freedom from their sin. They wanted political freedom. They were not interested in a Messiah who would give them food for their very souls. They wanted bread on their tables right now. They wanted Jesus Christ on their own terms. They wanted him to satisfy and meet the demands of their needs at this moment. Right now. There is no difference today. There is no difference today. So sad. There are, there are just like the many today who do not understand the very mission of Jesus Christ. They accept Jesus. We've seen it. Believing in Him. And they say they believe. They believe that He will give them physical health and wealth or success and happiness. Or that He will save their businesses. Or that they'll give them a job. Or that, they'll, that he'll deliver them from some trial or expe expected hardship. But when Jesus doesn't come through for them today and deliver them as they want to be delivered, they'll say things like this, I tried Christianity. It doesn't work. No different than the crowds. Jesus warned that there would be many like this in Matthew 11, verse 20, in his parable of the sower and the seed. It is Jesus' very knowledge of this that leads to the very next point in the message. You see, in stark contrast to the celebration all around him, stark contrast, everyone celebrating, Jesus began to do the opposite. He began to weep, something that only Luke records. So we see this superficial celebration of the Jews. Now, the sorrowful lamentation of Jesus, verses 41 and 42. As you approach Jerusalem, there is a spot on the Mount of Olives that when you reach it, you can see the whole city of Jerusalem before your eyes, spread out before you. The picture of Jerusalem you see on the screen behind you is the location to believe, to believe to be where Jesus wept over the city. It's right on the discourse coming down the mount, going past the Garden of Gethsemane into Jerusalem. This is standing right outside the building commemorating the event. So Jesus is there. When he approached Jerusalem, verse 41, he saw the city 
And he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes. And as Jesus was there, amid the celebrating crowds, Jesus began to weep over it, the city of Jerusalem. You know, this may surprise you, but Jesus was not having a tear running down his face. This event may surprise you. I don't know if you know this. This word, wept or weep here, it describes the deep lamentation of wailing. It is not the word used of Jesus when he wept at the graveside of Lazarus, which was a quieter shedding of tears. This was a heartbreaking, gut-wrenching sobbing as such for the dead. Is that how you picture Jesus crying over Jerusalem? <laughs> Why? Why was he weeping? He says, if you had only known, but now. Oh, the tragedy of it all. The tragedy is just seen on plays. Oh, how so very sad to have had the Son of God right there with you, only to have been so blinded. God, His very self, had come to them in the person of His Son, their Messiah, and Jerusalem missed it. Their day of opportunity, the Word tells us as a nation, had come and gone at this time. They did not recognize what? The things that make for peace, it says in verse 38 even though they were shouting, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And it went right over their head. You see, Israel's greatest enemy was not Rome. It was the sin within them. Israel's greatest need was not external political peace, but it was the peace that we have within the peace with God and of God. The world today, my friends, is still longing for peace, still searching for peace in their life. Peace without and peace of heart within. Yet still, just like Jerusalem, they do not know the things that make for peace. I can tell you right now, they do not know the things that make for peace. How can I tell you that with such specific uh, statement as that? Because Romans 3.17 says, The world apart from Christ does not know the path of peace. The things that make for peace, what are they? Repentance and the forgiveness of sins that comes with receiving Jesus Christ as one Savior and His and as our sin substitute, and then allowing Him through the Holy Spirit to dwell us and live a transformed life. It is the peace we have with God, Romans 5 1, because our sins are forgiven. And the peace of God now rules in our lives, Philippians 4, 17, because we are His children. Praise God for that. Are you thankful for that? But when the Prince of Peace is rejected, we must see something here in these passages. There is no peace. There's no peace whatsoever when Jesus Christ is rejected. You see, one day when the resurrected Jesus returns, something will happen. Israel will recognize Jesus as the Messiah that they crucified and they will repent in tears and they will finally receive him. Zechariah 12.10. Praise God. There's coming a day where they will recognize him. But what must we see here? Look at something. Look at the love. Look at the compassion of Jesus Christ. Look at his love and his deep compassion. You see, it is not a matter of indifference to Jesus whether they believed in him or not. It's not a matter of indifference to Jesus whether you believe in him or not. He cares very much. The blindness, the sinfulness, the hardness of man's heart, the unbelief of mankind breaks the very heart of the Lord to the point of weeping and wailing. Benjamin Bedon said, The Son of God in tears the wandering angel see. Be thou astonished, O my soul. He shed those tears for thee. 
He wept that we might weep. Each sin demands a tear. Praise God. And heaven alone no sin is found and there's no weeping there. <laughs> I like that last line. I need a little bit more shedding tears over sin. Thank the Lord for his compassion and love. Everybody, thank him. Okay. But let's look at something else. Later in that final week, we see the Savior heartbroken all over again. In Matthew 23, 37 through 39, listen. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together. The way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. One day Jesus is coming back. Notice what Jesus said. You were unwilling. You were unwilling. So many times, in so many ways, Jesus is still pleading with mankind today, Come unto me. Come unto me. Don't be unwilling. You have a choice. Come to me. But so many stubbornly still to this day plot like the Pharisees to kill him and say, I'm not willing. This Easter, this very Easter, looks like, like so many in the past, so many Easter's before us, crowds will gather in churches all across the land, all across the world. And they will celebrate Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. Yet they will still not believe Him as their personal Lord and Savior. That breaks my heart. That is heartbreaking beyond words. Yet to those who have received Him and to those who will receive Him on Easter, we can say, praise God, blessed is He who comes in the name of the Lord because He came to me and I, through the Holy Spirit, recognized that truth, received Him and accepted Him. Praise you, Lord. He came for me. He came for me once. And he's coming for me again. Praise God. Can you all smile? I'm going to look around every single face and I want to see a smile. Some of you, man, are too gloomy. God's alive and he's coming again. Praise God. All right. We got to thank him for his love. We have to thank him for his grace and his mercy. I will say it's so sad and tragic because when anyone turns their back on the gospel offer, when they do that, they are truly rejecting the very one who loves them more than anyone else ever has or ever will. We must pray for them. Oh, Lord, open up their eyes. If you know Christ is your Savior today, we can praise Him for that unconditional love. And if you're here today and you're unsure if you have the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, open your heart to this one who loves you, who's come to you and says, I want to triumphantly enter into you if you'll receive me. Do that today. Don't let your day of opportunity go by. We must, please, please, we must understand why Jesus Christ was weeping. We must get this. We must grasp this. Here again, only Luke records the reason for the Lord's weeping. It was this, Jesus saw the coming judgment. The third point this morning is the shocking devastation of Jerusalem. Verse 43 through 44, For the day will come upon you when your enemies will throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side. And they will level you to the ground and your children within you. And they will not leave you they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. That is horrific. That is horrifying. Here Jesus foretells the very shocking fall of Jerusalem, which is going to occur 70 years later, sometime between around 70 AD, less than 40 years away here, where the temple will also be destroyed. 
He says, because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. Their rejection of Jesus, their willful and persistent unbelief, it left nothing but judgment. You see, right now we're in a day of grace. We have the opportunity to receive and submit to the Holy Spirit and to follow Jesus. But there will come a day again when there is nothing left but to judge. In the providence of God, their very enemies would destroy their very beloved city. Mark 13, 1. This takes place during the week after the triumphal entry. As Jesus said, as, as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Here is the last time Jesus will leave the temple. He is days away now from being crucified where he will rip up the curtain of the Holy of Holies. The disciples, they directed the Lord's attention to the magnificence of Herod's temple. The temple, 46 years in the building, we know in John 2.19, and recognized as one of the architectural wonders of the Roman world. It was beautiful. Behold, Jesus, what wonderful stones! Josephus, the Jewish historian, he notes that some of the stones were 37 and a half feet by 12 feet by 18 feet. These were big. This was a magnificent temple. The great buildings would refer to the temple proper and the various courts within the chambers and the colonnades that were up on the mount. Yet at the culmination of the gruesome Roman Jewish wars of 66 to 70 AD, the temple and Jerusalem will be destroyed, all going back from Jesus' Palm Sunday. And the Roman general Titus ordered that the whole city be demolished. It only left one thing. It only left today's famous wailing wall. This wall right here. Right up here is the whole Temple Mount. It goes way back there. Way over here is the Mount of Olives as Jesus is looking down into Jerusalem. He comes down and he comes in from the other side. And over here is the Garden of Gethsemane. And right here is all that is left. The Romans, they were infuriated by the prolonged struggle with the fanatical Jewish defenders. And they mercilessly killed every Jew they could get their hands on. When Herb and I were there, I couldn't stop being heartbroken over what I saw. Right on the Temple Mount is the Muslim mosque in, the wor in worship to the false god Allah, right on the dome of the rock. The temple is no longer there. It used to sit here. It is destroyed. And now a false god is sitting on the mount. I was thankful that somebody in the group sent me these pictures. I was unaware that they were taking them. I remember praying to Jesus and asking him with tears going down my face to forgive me and forgive the world and to forgive Jerusalem as I prayed to God and saw the agony and what was going on there in that city. In the cracks there, there are notes stuffed in the cracks of begging and pleading God to remember them. Still... At that time, in those cracks, in those notes, denying Jesus Christ had already come to visit them. You cannot even step on the Temple Mount today and mention the name Jesus Christ. You cannot mention the name Jehovah without the Muslim-controlled Temple Mount kicking you off the Temple Mount. Herb, we almost got kicked out, didn't we? Remember that? You can't mention it. Just to the side of the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount, there's all the only thing left that shows that the Holies of Holies was ever there. This building right here, we stood right here in the middle of this. This is where the temple was. This is where the curtain was, is what they believe. It's destroyed. It's gone. There's not a single stone left. It's just this monument they built to where their temple used to stand. It's destroyed and gone. How can we miss the great truth seen here? 
when the compassionate love of the Savior is continually rejected, there remains in the end only the terrible devastation of judgment. Eventually it will culminate into the devastation of mankind's souls. Israel and Jerusalem are graphic lessons to this very fact. The Wailing Wall and the Temple Mount in Jerusalem today are but a testimony. They're just a testimony to Israel's gross ingratitude and God's just judgment for rejecting the day of their Messiah. Israel as a nation did not recognize the time of her visitation. Sadly, so many will not recognize the time of their visitation today on Easter Sunday. Oh, that such a blessed time of year to remember the Lord's love for us and for all of mankind. I want to praise God. I humbly thank Him. I humbly thank Him that he did not allow me to miss the opportunity. Are you glad you did not miss the opportunity of Jesus' call on your life? All by his grace. How awful, how bitter will be the wail of those who perish knowing they missed the day of their visitation, knowing they squandered the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, knowing they had a lifetime to accept the Messiah, but they did not. And now only judgment remains. Sad, sad. So what shall we do about these things? What shall we say? What shall we say to these things? First, just let me say, if you know Jesus is your Lord and Savior, praise Him. Thank Him with all your heart and give Him all the glory. Love Him with all your mind, heart, body, soul, and strength. That in the day He visited you, He opened up your heart to believe. What a gift. There is no greater gift. Amen. No greater gift. Secondly, if we know Jesus is our Savior, should we not have the same compassion for the lost? Do I have the tears, let alone weeping for those who are perishing like Jesus did? Jesus saw them and wailed. He weep with great agony. I want to say today, we can praise God that he had that triumphal entry that led him to the cross because he's going to triumphantly enter again. And we're going to be with him in glory. But until that time, we have something to proclaim. We have something to say that the Savior of the world has come. The Messiah is here. So let's invite people to come this Easter. Invite people to hear about Jesus Tell them about the one who loves them, loved them enough to die for them, and how his resurrection will change everything in their life. And that's what we're going to look at next week, how Easter has changed everything for those who believe in Jesus Christ. To all who are lost and thirsty is to come. Come, Revelation 22, 16 through 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you These things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say come. And let the one who hears say come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life without cost. Praise God. The spirit and the bride. That's you. With the Holy Spirit as we say come. Today, if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have time right now to receive Him and allow Him to be the Lord of your life to save you from your sins. Don't miss the opportunity. We may never have another tomorrow. How we should praise Jesus for His triumphal entry into Jerusalem to the cross for you and to the cross for me. We can ask ourselves, And as the hymn says, can it be that we should gain? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, hast died for me? He left his Father's throne above. So free, so infinite His grace. 
emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all. Immense and free. For oh my God, it found me. Praise God, I did not deny the day of my visitation. No condemnation for me now, I dread. Jesus, all in Him, is mine. It's mine. Jesus is mine. Alive in Him, my living head, I felt in righteousness divine. Bold now, with boldness I approach His eternal throne, and I claim the crown through Christ Jesus, my own amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, should die for me? Praise Him. Let's praise Him. Sing it. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go.